in the airport, it was overnight with the weight sort of almost first light where we moved out into Basra. Um, I think it was PWR on, on the initial board. And, and our, our role there was to clean up the site. So we were the sort of the first people on the site, if you want to call it. Um, and uh, it was a mixture of clearing up the bodies, five bodies, and, and the actual helicopter itself, you know, so there was nothing left um, on, on there. And, and uh, you know, getting quite up close and personal with picking up body parts and trying to work out which body it belongs to, I suppose, um, is, you know, we were right right in the thick of it. Um, a good mate of mine adds, you know, I remember just staring at him as, as he tried to lift the pilot out and only pull out half a body, for example. And it was just a mess, I mean, as you can imagine, it, it was just a mess. Mate, from what I can see, you've been hitting it quite hard. <laughs> you could say that, I suppose. Hi, mate. I've got this idea for a challenge. Dad. 10 triathlons, 10 days, in 10 different locations around the UK. Today's suggestion, recovery. How are you, brother? Yeah, not too bad, buddy. Thank you. So, first off, I guess we should say thank you to Claire, Claire Vosper, for putting yes. us in touch. Hello, Indeed. Claire. Um, for people who are watching, that's Claire from V Force, who we're going to go and do some driving with at some point this year. And, mate, from what I can see, you've been hitting it quite hard. <laughs> you could say that, I suppose. Um, it's 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 been pretty pretty full on in in a in a pandemic I suppose of of all of the things you know and um, just basically out there trying to trying to make a difference and raise as much money as possible in those sort of difficult circumstances you know yeah I mean I had a quick look at your social media and it it's um gosh you've been pushing yourself through the pain barrier a bit what should we go back to the beginning how did all this start. Um, I suppose in a nutshell, we um, I I was in the in the military in the army for 15 years as as a soldier and officer. Uh, I commissioned from from the ranks, um, and then unfortunately I was discharged in 2008, 17, sorry, with um, with a, a dodgy shoulder and um, which has now been a, a partial replacement and, and mainly PTSD. Um, from, from an incident in, in Iraq in 2006 when, when a Lynx helicopter was shot down. and I mean, that, that didn't bother me at the time, but it was in 2015 I was in, in Batis as a med troop commander and this uh, one of the soldiers on the, the permanent staff out there had fallen into a fire and we'd deal with it. And what, and what the trigger point was, in essence, was the burning flesh of that individual reminding me. And, and I just started to be a different person, you know, not your... Your typical army officer, uh, moral compass. I was, I was being a bit of a bit of a tit, really, to be honest. And um, you know, fighting, angry, that type of thing. Um, and and it got sort of bad at a point where it's affected my family. Um, so I've got a a wife and two two young daughters, and mm -hmm. something needed to change me. And in 2018, I was um, at a point of uh, okay, I've got a, I've got a carry on this route and going and and uh, which I don't want to do so I'm, I'm, I'll end my life or I um, change it and literally overnight I, I change the whole way of I operate and I get up early uh, you know super early 0 3.30 0 4.30 and and train and, and really hit it hard and only this year or sorry this year 2020 the start of it was like okay what can I do I need a, I need objectives I need goals I need to I need routine to get me into some sort of training why and the, what's the need for me to train and I started to look at these ultra, ultra events since, um, you know, my, my background sprinting and rugby seven. So short, sharp paces stuff. Um, I was just, I was a physical training instructor in the military. So I've always had that, you know, baseline fit, if you want to call it. And I believe the rest is mindset. Um, as you know, it's once you get to that pain bar, it's just pushing through. And, and, and now I'm just trying to test how far that will go. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so what regiment are we talk, talking, Daz? I was Royal Engineers um, as a soldier, and then I commissioned into the Med Corps. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's it really. Um, did a couple of you no know, courses within. Um, had had the Bash of Selection. 
unfortunately 2015 on it my mum passed away um, and that was for SFC um, and uh, yeah so just um, I, I think I wasn't really everything was sort of I shouldn't have been on the course it was one of those you know um, physically I was there mentally not uh, and then with my mum passing it was it topped it you know yeah uh, you. just uh, now and, and that's when everything started to go downhill really to be honest mate and um, yeah it led to what, medical discharge what year was Iraq because that's kind of that's increasingly becoming like history now, isn't it, Iraq? It was. It is, yeah. I mean, um, so that 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 deployment was two thousand six, Talagate. Um, I don't know if you remember on the news, it was the whole um, the, the helicopter shot down, Lynx helicopter, and it was I think the first female killed in the Iraq War was that's why it was so big. There was five five people in that when the Lynx was shot down over Basra, and there's I think the, the same. Incident, obviously, as you can imagine, that tracks a lot of um, civ pop and and um, and the riots, etc. Went with it, and you know we had um, obviously infantry ground on on the ground control and that. And um, I think remember this famous scene of one of the guys on fire coming at the back of the, the top of the warrior. Um, that that was that sort of that all uh, basically the, the outcome, the, the fallout from the, from the helicopter going down. So. And um, yeah, I've actually met him as well through Help for Heroes. I can't remember his name, Joey or something rings a bell, but yeah, nice lad. Yeah, wasn't that to do with, there were a couple of incidents where the SCS were captured. The one with the guy burning on the tank, wasn't it? Where they drove it through, or am I, I'm, I'm probably getting, my memory's probably confusing two incidents. Potentially, you, yeah, past that, the, the, the the SS one doesn't ring a bell with me. I, I mean, I was only 19, 20 years old at the time. Um, I, was a, I was a young sapper just being told what to do. You know, I was, um, yeah, didn't even know why I was there. <laughs> um, without sort of, you know, putting you through too much trauma, what, what was your like connection to this helicopter? Did you have to deal with it or was it just, was it a traumatic thing for everybody at, at the time? So um, our connection was we, we just, so my, being Royal Engineers, you know, and having um, access to cutting tools, etc., and then and, and just the general sort of um, movement, big cranes, etc. Because we we initially tried to lift it with the crane, we couldn't. My my role out, out there I was um, force protection or escort multiple, so we would escort everyone from every sort of cat badge um, and and other coalition forces around the country, and so we had quite a quite a good um, sort of layout of the grounds. So we we'd been everywhere, and. Um, we, uh, there's 12 of us as an escort multiple, we came back into Basra um, tribal log base um, and then we got crashed back out there and there to the A-pod. We knew something had happened, we didn't really know what was going on. And um, in the A-pod it was overnight, we had to wait the sort of almost first light where we moved out into Basra, um, I think it was PWR on, on the initial cordon. And our, our role there was to clean up the site, so we were the sort of the first people on the site if you want to call it. Um, and uh, it was a mixture of clearing up the bodies, five bodies, and, and the actual helicopter itself, you know, so there was nothing left um, on there. And, and uh, you know, getting quite up close and personal with picking up body parts and trying to work out which body it belongs to, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, we were right, right in the thick of it. Um, a good mate of mine adds, you know, I remember just staring at him as, as he tried to lift the pilot out and only pull out half a body, for example. And it was just a mess. I mean, as you can imagine, it, it was just in a mess. Um, but, but that said, I mean, up until this incident in 2015, nothing was there, you know, and there was nothing. Uh, I felt grand. And uh, it was this, um, we were on exercise now in Batis in Canada, and, and you get quite a lot of fires out there. And, and one of the permanent staff who were trained to beat the fires out to stop them from spreading because they spread quite fast out there. I'm not, I'm not aware if you've been to Canada or Batis or not, but um, the, it ignited and, and she'd fallen into it and um, she then got sent to us. And there was actually about seven people injured of smaller burns, but she was face, arms, no dripping flesh off her. And it was my responsibility. And she almost died. Uh, her family got flown out from the UK to sort of say goodbyes really. But um, luckily, thankfully she didn't. And, I sort of took it a bit personally in that point, you know, you're not in the wartime environment, you're training exercising, so it's a bit different. Um, and, and then having to look after my team that took it a bit personally as well. Um, 
but it was the smell. I, I remember sitting afterwards, you know, and, and I, I knocked the team off for the evening and said, look, guys, just get your head down. I'll, I'll deal with everything and uh, radio, et cetera, this evening. And um, just, just chill out and, and sort of re regenerate yourselves. And I remember sitting inside the, the, the 12 to 12 tent and, and the smell of just the burning flesh was the trigger point. But um, yeah, I just didn't, didn't think anything of it. And, and, and then sort of came back. And that's what sort of psychologists now have sort of linked it to, you know? Mm. Did did you find yourself sort of resenting the the military or the, or the army? Not at the time, no, uh, not at all, Chris. Um, I think what I I find myself now is resenting the discharge process. Some people go through a good one, others don't. Um, you tend to find, and and I've heard this across the board. I don't know any truth of it. I'm just going off hearsay. Of as an officer, you sort of like a slip through the net. No, you're expected to sort of have it your deal with it yourself I think in essence um so yeah and and, and that's it you know and of um were you discharged on the right tier level etc should have you been discharged so on and so forth you know I was only um that's three years now I was 32 you know I still thought and and I joined as a sapper and I was a captain at the time and looking to pick up major so I I, I still think I had a I would have had a good career left in me mm. um especially if I had a sort of Got myself in good neck and went back down the sort of SF route, which was my aspirations from from a young sapper. Yeah, got you. Okay. And so when you arrived in Civvy Street, what what was your state of mind then, and, and what what were your actions? A bit of both. I tried to um, embrace it, I suppose, to start with, to try and excite myself about it. Um, during my last seven months of service, um, my, my OC was quite generous and he just let me um, crack on and sort of try and civilianize myself, if you want to call it, through work experience. So I, I went and worked in um, KPMG in, in the city in Canary Wharf. And, and unknown to me at the time, you know, it, it was just, uh, it was probably the worst thing I could have done of being in busy, busy train lines going in and into London. And my PTSD was getting worse and worse. And I thought, I didn't know what was wrong with me. This was 2017 again. Um, and and then I I sort of like carried that on going for like five months. It was supposed to be a six month sort of um, military intern scheme, they call it, uh, to go in. And I just couldn't do it. So I left and went into scan skin to construction, which seemed to be a bit more military of, of the banter, et cetera, uh, and, and managing I on site, you know, the odd, that type of stuff. And um but it's it's not it's not me, you know. I, I'm still sort of uh, scratching my head and, and looking every day, and, and I've been very successful in the role, you know, uh, roles that I've been doing. I had a couple of promotions to the items, and quite a sort of senior role now. But just doesn't doesn't tick that box for me. It doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. Um, mm. So, and then I think that's where this endurance and charity feedback and um, pushing myself is where it's really at, you know, and. There's a documentary coming out on Sunday of the of the one of the bigger events last year, and um, this is where I really want to start going. I've now got myself an agent, and and really pushing it into spreading the awareness of you know why I was at this point of of wanting to take my life to turn it all around overnight. And I know that can be different for everyone, but you you've got to find that in here that makes you want to do that. And and for me, it was my kids. Um, you know, I grew up without a father until I was uh, I was adopted at eleven by my dad. Um, so I didn't want them to have, didn't not have that, you know, in the life. And it's very important. So it was all around um, what what makes me tick, and my kids made me tick, and I've got to do it for them, and I want them to be proud of me, and that's why I get off and doing and pushing the boundary as far as it will go, you know, in, in the whole mind, um, and everything else will mm. will do that, and and on doing so, you know, getting the coverage like on podcasts like this, for example, is. Is about there. There is another way than than suicide. You know, there there is something else that can be done. You've just got to work out what that is for you, and and everybody's going to be different. And I always refer back to if if you take two people at ninety kilograms, six foot tall, whatever, put them on the exact same fitness and diet routine, you're going to get two completely different outcomes. So you've got to find out which works for for you. Mm -hmm. That's a good analogy. Yes. It's hard when you're younger as well, because society indoctrinates us with so many like rules or aspirations and, and 
I, I think it must be hard, especially coming out the forces as well, because it's so regimented. It, it's hard to either cast that aside or just retune it into like being your own person and doing what you want to do and, and yeah. making, you know, like I literally have made all my own rules up just yeah it's why i'm always content because i made a rule well don't not be content yeah. <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> with a guest yeah is that your is that your uh trainer she wants you to go and do a few my, laps uh, or something my, my wife probably send but the kids <laughs> um but yeah i think because I, I do think about this a lot and I do wonder if a lot of people are taking their lives and I know there's a myriad of reasons and factors we, we we all know that but I do think if one of them is like when you ascribe to someone else's rules you're going to be pissed off because they're not usually in your 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 favor Daz do you know what I mean 100% and, and it's not a one-size-fits-all solution and, and that's why um it's probably got to where it's got to, you know, when people do take a life and it's, uh, it's, it's not a nice thing or attempt to. And what is that? You know, what is that one? What, how, how, how do we, how do we fix that? You know, is, is, is one of the questions I always ask myself, what, what can we do? And more as a, as a, a sort of, you know, group of ex-military people, as veterans, understanding it more, you know, and what is there something that can be done at that level to push up to government or does the government need to do more? It, it, there's so many, Murad has said, of reasons that there's never one one solution fits all. I just know what works for me. And if someone else, if that worked for someone else, then that's brilliant, you know? Yeah, we're in the real early days of understanding trauma. Not and that's not just military, tra you know, related trauma as well, um, because it's not it's not just what you experience whilst you're in the military. It's a, it's you it's a byproduct of your your whole life, isn't it? Absolutely, and you know, they they reckon up and that now the sort of the twenty twenty onwards, we're going to feel get more PTSD trauma from from the Afghan war. Um, and then probably you could probably predict in 2030 we're going to get NHS trauma from from COVID, you know, and mm. PTSD similarities. Yeah, and of course these are just these are just the catalysts. They're not the drivers. Mm. You know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but I do think I, I'm a I'm a big believer in you know healthy body, healthy mind. I do believe that if more people trained uh, or I'm not just, I'm not saying thrash yourself to the level that, that some people do, but just getting out and walking around, etc. I've just um, today actually tried to implement something for this next lockdown within my business in work where I work in a day to day at Skanska about, you know, making sure you structure your day and daily routine, you know, how, and, and don't underestimate those, the basics, doing the basics well of getting out and walking at your lunch, etc. grabbing yourself away from the computer. Um, but so I, I'm, a, I'm a massive believer in in that and, and I feel when when I've done one of these events and I've been injured during it or whatever and can't do what I want to do it plays with my head so so massively you know it's a massive only contributing factor rather than you know a big one that, that I can't get out and do something yeah there is a danger there isn't there if you put all your eggs into fizz by fizz for our friends at home, I mean sport or exercise. <laughs> yeah. When it gets taken away from you, which invariably it will, because we all get old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you need to have a bit of, but you know, develop other philosophies to balance out that 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 loss. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. And in the short term, though, you know, if you're trying to get over alcoholism or 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 you know bereavement or whatever it might be yeah get out and smash some fizz if it works it's yeah it's better than it's better than falling into a, a deep depression isn't it a hundred percent you know and i've not um i've not really experienced that addiction to any sort of thing drugs alcohol myself and but uh, but I've, I've i've experienced it personally with that's the reason why my mum isn't here anymore you know and um so and and 
she never recognized that she had a problem. That's why she couldn't fix it, you know, and I've actually developed a, a, a little model that's, that's in my books. I'm writing my books, hopefully going to go out around Easter each time. Um, and it's in there about a, a, a roar model. So you've got a roar, you know, like, like a, sounds a bit cheesy, but roar like a lion and, and you'll have that pride about yourself. And you've, the first R is uh, you've got to recognize there's something wrong, but you can't do anything without recognition. And then, and then the next, the O is uh, own it. So you've got to have ownership on what that is, whether that's, a physical something or a mental something, you know, is it take my mum, for example, alcoholism, or take somebody who's broken a leg, you've got to own in the fact you've got a broken leg or or you're an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And then a act. So you've got to act on on that. And it was one of the most important ones. And then the last R is a sort of a double revisit um or results. So you'll get results from it or you revisit back down the back down the rest of the mnemonic and, and then move on from there. Though you might you might recognize that something you have you might recognize what you want it to be, but that might not be the underlying problem. If that makes yeah. sense, you've got to drop back down and then restart. Yeah, yeah massively. It reminds me of, a, there's a model in social science called um, the cycle of change or the stages of change. Mm -hmm. By a couple of social scientists called Prochaska and De Clemente. And they talk about, it's basically just what you said, but, but um, it's used a lot in in um, addiction work, but it's the basis for all change. All it, it we don't really understand change well because we don't teach the right things in our schools, you know. Mm. Um, but when you understand change, you realise everyone that changes for whatever reason, it's all done on this model. It's all first, like you said, you've got to recognise it. Um, in the addiction field or the mental health field that's called well this what you what in the old days they called denial you know when someone's in denial that they've got a problem for whatever reason but that that's referred to as pre-contemplative so at the stage before you've even thought that i need to make changes and some people will die of mm -hmm. you know some people will drink themselves to death in in that phase without ever recognizing that they've got a problem and yeah yeah that, that gets a bit close to home when you've been in the forces because you get some of these old boys they they just won't admit that it's a you know yeah you're, you're absolutely right and and especially won't admit and then and then having that you said the older boys school and even when i was in at the start of it, it was very drinking culture so that's all you know that's that's your your pacifier isn't it you know and, yeah. then, and and we all did it together you know we we're all sort of guilty as it is such but that's all it's so indoctrinated into from the start you know how, how you bond you go out drinking together you know mm. um and then as you said but there's a lot of stiff upper lip approach um which i had and and that's why i went got to where i did i didn't want to admit there was something wrong do you know i'm i'm a tough squatty you know there's nothing wrong with me um and, and then yeah you've now got it and that's why i like to talk about it now and sort of stand up there and, and i'd admit there was something wrong and and still is and, and how i manage it mm. uh, because hoping the fact that i can do it others others can but let's talk about the um the endurance stuff then what did you you so you've had your kind of um epiphany or your reason to change you said your children yeah did you then set out to take on a challenge or did it come along accidentally or, or had you sort of done a few half marathons like like many of us have done or no i never done anything like that as i said my background was sprinting and um uh you know and and, and rugby and then i couldn't play rugby anymore because of my shoulder um and and then but i was still into sprinting you know i went to um, the Warrior Games, uh, which is where the Invictus Games originated from, so the American version, and still sprinting there and setting a couple of records and enjoying the high well, and gold medals there. And um, it, it, but I've been sprinting as a kid from a kid, and I thought to myself, you know, I need to push this further and further. And then and then I just googled one night the, the most the most extreme event in the world, and up popped the Monte Yukon Arctic Ultra and signed up for it there and then lying in bed and and then that that was this time last year and uh just i just got hooked on this 
on this uh, multi-endurance overnight jobs, you know, sleep deprivation. And I just got really hooked on it. And because I found it when I'm out on my own for hours and hours and hours on end that I had that that's that's what I'm thinking but I'm generally thinking not about how much pain I'm in or when we're so I'm thinking about what's next you know so I'm always having that constant what's next um to keep me thinking yeah I was so I'm just typing something into my computer here mate because I I I came across this ultra that you mentioned um I saw mm. some something about it on LinkedIn. Who's the chap that organises it? A guy called Robert Paulhammer. Ah, uh, it's a different guy. name. Different name to the one I'm thinking. I, it might. It might be that there's different races, but. Well, there's the six six three three, which is very similar, which is the longitude latitude lines. That's what's. Um... Yeah, I, I just saw one where people were up up somewhere in the Arctic Circle and they were running for days and. Um, yeah, and, and and that's it, you know, and it's basically that pulling a pulk, self-sufficient, hit your checkpoint, go. Do you have to camp on it? It's yeah, yeah. So um so the, the Yukon Arctic, you've got a couple of um couple of fields in it, so you can go and out there and do a marathon. So the first checkpoint's a marathon distance, and we tend to get mainly locals doing it. Um and uh, this year, uh, Jordan Wiley came out with me and he did the marathon there as part of his uh, 10 coldest um, uh, marathons. And then the, the next one would be uh, 100 miles, then there's a 300 mile, then there's a 430 mile or so. Yeah, there's, so you've got to, as, as, as it says, pull your pulk, so everything in it, your tent. And then it's up to you to plan your, your checkpoints and where you want to kip and put your put your bivy up or your tent up whatever you're using and um and and go out and complete the race are you on skis or are you no on foot so um yeah you're on foot and uh yeah it's just sometimes you come across some of the the water flows that's come up and the first part's on on the yukon river that's all frozen um and it's uh yeah so it's quite an interesting race i mean we dropped to i think it was minus 40 or minus 50 so you generally do drop like the minus 50 level blimey yeah <laughs> my it's gosh the, the famous um you know the yukon dog race it's it's that in reverse the, the, the some of it a 430 miles that is the long one so yeah it's uh quite an interesting race yeah. and on, on Two two years ago would be three years this year. There was a, an Italian ultra guy on it, and and he um, he ended up losing amputation of both hands, and both feet through hypothermia or sorry frostbite on hypothermia. Mm. And and from there they've been quite rigid. When you get to a checkpoint, you get uh, frostbite checks, hypothermia checks, etc. And any sort of discoloration, like even your finger discoloration, you get pulled from the race. So it's all about your personal admin as well. And I got to the 100 um, mark, and um, which was checkpoint two. And I was actually sat in second in the race. And everyone was like, who's this guy? You know, I, I've not come from an ultra. But I find it good. I, I was in good good stead. And the only problem I had was um, in the November prior to coming out in the January, I had this huge scar across my back with these things done. I've had seven ops on this shoulder. And they um, did a nerve graft. And I completely lost feeling in my in my left arm, um, completely gone. And it was actually a Navy medic um, a guy, a Gav, uh, who actually he pulled me from the event um, because I was deemed unsafe to set up my um, my bivy, which he was right. I couldn't I couldn't even unclip my pulp. And um, uh, yeah, but I, I mean, I had full intentions to go back this now, but obviously with COVID, that's been uh, kiboshed and pushed to next year. So I'll, I'll go back next year and. Be a bit more prepared. I.e., there's no. I wouldn't change my my routine. I wouldn't change anything. I would literally just change the fact that I'm not going on eight weeks after a major surgery. Mm. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's an amazing place. You know, it's amazing people you meet. Amazing people. I'm friends with people that I met on it. You know, and it's loved it. I had the best time of my life. Yeah, I bet. What What's the overall distance? Did you say it's around four hundred? You can. So you can do. Um, the marathon 100 300 or 430 so the 430 miler is every every two years so you don't clash with the dog runs uh, on that so um 
I was in because the last year 430 wasn't available I, I went in for the 300 so it takes I think around five six days and, and again it's just personal admin so the first night I think like 60% of the field dropped out so you come off off the river the Yukon River and you've got one of the places called Overland Trail and there's a couple of reasons a lot of people that you know it's getting dark people set up if you know and then at this point and, and it's your last sort of safe moment to to get out if you're having trouble there's a big massive like camper van there huge out there and we'll take you back to the as in a freebie um tazzy vac if you want to call it whereas if you go past that then you've started got to pay your mine was a snowmobile so i've I, I got charged for a tazzy vac or or helicopter um and that point there i think it was minus 43 that first night and my my theory was everyone stopped then and, and you know yourself when you get into a DOS bag at that cold you don't want to get back out at all you know it's like it's a proper morale dampener and um so I thought I'll just push on through and, and that's exactly what it is and I, I got to the next checkpoint around half seven eight o'clock in the morning so sun coming up and that's where I plan to do about four or five hours rest you know the sun hitting the side of the tent warming up from the inside you know having that sort of theory and um and it was yeah and that's when I couldn't put it up that's when they were like, okay, you know, um, let's come and have a chat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea of the mileage here, Daz. So it, it sounds like you're doing about 50 miles a day. Yeah, you can. So my, my plan was to go straight to it's in the 100. So I got 100K and it was 100 miles. It was just over 100K I got to. 100 miles was a third checkpoint. And that's where I got, that's my plan was to get straight to there in about, 36 40 hours that was my plan mm. um but yeah so some people would break it down if you break it down to sort of anywhere between i think you've got to maintain around the 40 miles a day because there's certain checkpoints you've got to get to like checkpoint three and checkpoint five by a certain time or or you get pulled you know that's uh you've got to get there otherwise you'd be out for days you know you could just do it leisurely 20 miles a day and just crack on but so you've got to manage it. Well, that's what I like about it. It's it's how you want to run the race. Um, it's um, yeah, gleaming, but I'm, I'm 100% gone back. Um, and I, I, the, the the Yukon, the, the territory, you know, amazing. And and I hallucinated and everything. It was fantastic. I thought I'd seen a manatee. I was having a, having a conversation in the middle of the middle of the Arctic, well, the, the Yukon Arctic, for uh, with a manatee. <laughs> it's like, turned out to be a log, but hey oh. Um, so that's a that's some distance to cover if you say you're pulling a poke as well yeah yeah so i mean my poke weighed about i think it was about 18 20 kilograms mm. but the poke for me wasn't much i trained with the bergen on brecon beacons and, and and i ran 70 miles around the isle of white uh around the loop of, of the isle of white with with a with a bergen on um, so my training, I, I was the whole philosophy of train hard, fight easy, you know, um, train with the same weight as I would have in a pulk on my back and, and, and up over Brecon. So for me, I, I didn't find much anything really different of it. What I thought, what, what I would change, I say I wouldn't change much, what I would change next time, I, from, my, from my harness to my pulk, I had ropes. So when it was up and down at parts like this, you know, the pulk was whacking me in the back of the calves and all sorts. And really really just pissing me off no bit of coming a um unless it was a big hill where i just sat in my pulk and went down it. so uh yeah so yeah that for that for me and they said the first 40k of that was really really challenging they were actually at, um up until the race started right right up between like an, an hour or two before they didn't know they were going to actually start the race from the marathon which is the first checkpoint because the the conditions were that bad and no and and basically walking in deeper snow and, and a bit you know, of the of the the water coming up through and stuff it was a bit dangerous and they said you know this is the hardest it's been in years on this first bit and I got past that bit feeling fine you know and I thought well if that's all it's going to be then I'll just keep going mm. yeah but it's 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 a I, I think the the record for the 300 miles is about five and a bit days um proper proper going Sam yeah well it yeah, it is. I mean, 
so it won't this won't mean my, my thinking probably won't mean a lot to people at home it's not helpful <laughs> in the middle of a podcast it's just my mind works the way you know that i know running and and that that I know endurance stuff and I'm not particularly good at it, but, but that's, that's why I know it. Cause I know, I know how hard it is. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, that's doing like 60 miles a day or something, isn't it? And, so I, I was, I was, um, my, my plan, no plan survives contact probably was, I was, um, 50 to 55 miles a day, uh, in, in that sort of traveling around that, um, sort of two miles so at some points we were doing um well i was doing i, I met up with a canadian guy at a long part you know a guy called chad and we with good good banter because he was he was going to stop at this overland trail and i says mate i'm going if you want to go and he came with me and um yeah i mean we were down to like two and a half k's an hour at some point so um i was working on mileage and he was working on k's and and since then i've worked on k's because it's such a morale boost for me for when you're knocking off the K's rather than the miles. <laughs> and that's all I'm doing it for. So I now work in K's. <laughs> what sort of rations did you have? Did you ha have dried rations? Yeah, so um, I used, thankfully I was sponsored can I, um, with, with Kit and I used um, uh, fire pot food. So uh, it's, it's, it's Vango, the, the, the company Vango that sort of own, over, overarching own them and Actually, on the Vango website, I wrote a blog on, on the fire pot food about how good it was. I mean, talking 600 calories per um, per meal. And but what what was amazing with it, once you stopped, melted your snow and um, poured it into where it needed to be, you had to wait 15 minutes, a bit like a pot noodle. And, and it, I just whacked it down my jacket for heat. And so it was, it was quite good. And, and, and on the sort of hot coal thing, people think, oh, my goodness, you know, minus 50 it must be layers and layers upon layers and not at all it's the opposite because you're working hard you know you've got to stop yourself from sweating um was the main thing because as soon as you stop you instantly feel the cold you know it's like going to the toilet you build up until it's about to come out and you just quickly go and, and back on you know mm. all those little minor admin pieces must take ages to melt the water or can you can you just get the water from the rivers no, so um, there's no there's no rivers and it's completely frozen over there and um, not really. I mean that the because you use a like an MSR cook thing where it's um, basically a blue flame, no heat, and uh, on your pot and there um, it, it takes seconds. You literally just dump the snow in and it's the snow's melting in your hand. It's that really really fine fresh snow, um, and and it, no, it was, it was pretty pretty uh, pretty quick actually. Yeah, because you, yeah. you wouldn't want to get dehydrated. No, no, that, that, that's it. And it's about um, putting the right foods in at the right time and, and constantly trying to... I use the Camelback. Everyone told me not to use a Camelback for, for water. And um, so I put warm water in at the checkpoints. Um, I put quite warm water in. And that was, was enough to get me um, to to near the next, next, next checkpoint where then I used then... Um, I, I had a flask of like a hot chocolate type of stuff, you know, in, in it. And everyone said, don't use the Camelback because, you know, the, the tube will freeze um, and so on and so forth. But I put my base layer on and then I put the Camelback on. So it was staying warm in my body heat. And then every, and when I took a drink, again, it's the, it's the admin of blowing back into it. There's, there's no water in the tube. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's quite quite good. Yeah, you can't always listen to what everyone else says, can you? No, no, exactly. I was yeah. in, uh, I was waiting for a chopper in Norway once. And um, again, you do all this, like you're saying, you do all this training and everyone's telling you, right, you would just use flasks, you know. I, I don't know why in the Arctic you drink tea and coffee, other than the fact, obviously, it's nice to have a cuppa Morale, in that kind yeah. of conditions. But it's the most dehydrating drink you can next to alcohol. It's the yeah, most dehydrating yeah. drink you can drink. Yeah. But we would make up a flask, and to be honest, it, it like I, I don't know how we did it really, but one flask would last you all day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think you all ended up a bit dehydrated towards the end of the day, and then you rehydrated once you're in your, you know, in in your tent. But hundred percent, yeah. 
we're waiting for this chopper and the lad next to me just reaches in his jacket, pulls out this water bowl <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> what? <laughs> He's like, yeah. do, do you want some? Yeah, yeah. Like, I thought that would freeze. We would yeah. tell that yeah. would freeze. He's like, no, I always do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's it's that, you know, people were giving me advice before who've never even been up there, you know, in, in those type of cold conditions. They just think of, you know, what you see these scientists working in the Arctic of big boots on. You know, I wore Solomon trainers, Gore-Tex trainers. Yeah, um, yeah. but it's the underfoot, no, the, the socks that make the difference, you know. Yeah, it's the same. When I scuba dived in Antarctica, one of the guys in a local dive shop here was like, Right, you got to wear this and you got to have this thermal under and you've got to have this. You... So I called the guy from who met the, from my wetsuit company in Sweden, who really had a really good dry suit. He's like, No, 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 just just yeah. a thin layer underneath you. you I'm like, yeah, but it is the Antarctic. It's like, yeah, I've just, he says, I've just been in the Arctic teaching the Swedish army how to dive. So believe me, just, just a thin yeah. layer underneath, you'll be, yeah. you'll be, you'll be fine. And, uh, and lo and behold, yeah, you, you are You're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was this the first project you took on when you decided, you know, things needed to change? Absolutely. Um, and, and from there, it was a, uh, a complete hook, you know, um, I've actually, I'm referring to my computer here because I've, I've done a few this year. And um, so I, uh, so prior to that there, I thought I need to train and, and, you know, in the military, you don't do that amount of distance, do you? You don't really do anything over sort of 50k, even in the military. So I thought about some training. The very first thing I did actually was the 4th of January last year, and it was um, run the perimeter of the Isle of Wight in, in just sort of one hit. It was 113K, um, did that around 17 hours. And as we said, I was carrying some kit on that just to, just to get around there. Then I wanted to get a sort of an idea of a um, sleep deprivation. So I did the old um, army fitness test, you know, the 2.4K run, 50 presses, 50 sit-ups. Um, and I did that on the hour, every hour for, for 20, 24 hours um, just to get a bit of sleep deprivation. And that was 58K total, so it was quite good. And then I did the Yukon. Um, and then coming back from the Yukon, um, uh, I was a bit, so that was February, I was back, um, sort of just getting back into normality and everything. And then I, I wanted to do something for VE Day, which was 75 miles for 75th anniversary. It was, um, so I did that on a treadmill um, I ran and it was a lockdown that happened. So I ran 75 miles, actually 76 um, and uh, on a treadmill in a 12 by 12 military tent um, in, in complete darkness. Um, and, and I wrote a blog on uh, mindset and isolation on that about how we push through. And up until my pre stuff towards the end last year, that was my hardest. Um, that was no, I don't think it was, it was physically hard or, or sorry, mentally hard, but the physical element of no incline, decline, same terrain, you know, my feet, the swelling on my feet was horrendous and, and my legs on that one. And I remember at 51 miles, it was, it was brutal and, and my body was shutting down completely um, on this. And, you know, I was literally running to the toilet every, I couldn't even get 400 meters out of me and I had to get off and run to the toilet. And my body was in a proper shaking um, mode. Um, that is so weird you say that because when I did my 200 miler at Christmas, the first 100 miles of which was on the track, I was, I, I'll be honest, I knew it would be a bit boring, which I didn't, I didn't mind that. I'm, I'm boring enough, right? So I'm used to it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't mind the boredom, but I genuinely figured it was going to be easy because it was a running track, right? Mm -hmm. And I figured I'd just tick off to, you know, four laps is a mile. And it, I just, yeah. I honestly, but within the first marathon, I realised something wasn't right. It wasn't, yeah. something wasn't right. Like you said, I could barely go a lap sometimes without having to go for a pee. Yeah. Um, my left ankle just started to give me problems 
before I'd even done a, a marathon, right? Yeah, yeah. And I've done 38 marathons one after the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, wow. with, okay, I had a very bad shin splint, but as far as joints went, it wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that was because I was going left all the time. Maybe it was a, maybe I should have turned around and gone the other way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but just the boredom factor and the reason I know it was different is when the track shut on Christmas Eve I then just went onto the road and I ran around Dart Plymouth and Dartmoor yeah so much easier yeah even though 100%. I was running up some of the steepest hills in probably in the country yeah because it's, I could um... look around and see different scenery and and have stuff distracting my my senses well i mean yeah. i'm guessing it was just a lot i think so because when you're saying you're on a track on a treadmill um you can only think about what's happening <laughs> you know there's nothing else is that it's up to your imagination to keep going and that's why i enjoyed it you know it pushed me in that that mindset way and yeah i mean it, it was a difficult one um i must flick you over the uh the uh, it was in pathfinder magazine in the military i must i'll flick over i'll find it and then send it over to you afterwards the uh um the the piece that was written up on it and wow. um, but yeah and then and then so that was may uh looking in july so i did 203 kilometers in july um again so i was trying to start being creative here with uh with um lockdown and everything and covid and so I, I left my house. Um, I had 54 pound on my back. I did 84 kilometers to Fort Gilkicker down in um, Gosport. Um, I I put my Bergen, um, which was an Osprey Bergen, in the water um, and swam. Uh, it ended up being four miles, six k over to the Isle of Wight. Got to the other end, and then and then I did a, a the 70 miles, 113 k around the Isle of Wight. Um, I think that took me. 36 37 hours to do that so 203k in that um never swam in open water like that before in my life and um yeah from my garment it's just this big <laughs> curve it was i think it was a mile and a half point to point and i thought that's all right and swim my lap and yeah but pushing a bergen it was difficult you swam out to the isle of Wight. yeah yeah pushing a bergen or pulling a bergen pushing it yeah i had my I had it here so actually, um, yeah, I had it here and it was sort of acting as a wave breaker. And then, um, and then yeah, just as you would do a river crossing, exactly like it. I'd rather um, not do river crossings, mate, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I thought I'd do a sea storm. I got the idea. So a, a good mate of mine who was my safety on it, um, uh, Tim Barnes, don't know if you're wearing a Mex booty. Um, he's 52, 53 years old now. And um, he was in a kayak as my immediate support, and I had a rib as because I had to I had to feel like risk assessments go through the portmaster and everything to warn all these shippers and everything because it's quite a busy um, shipping mm -hmm. uh, as, as I found out and, and those things when you're when you're in the water a couple of hundred meters away from them they're massive um, so yeah so um, that and then got out the other side um, had a twenty minute kip and then and then ran ran the Isle of Wight. Um, that was uh that was that was a, an interesting one no reason for that did you swim back again no got on a ferry mate okay. and what um, um, what wetsuit did you wear for the swim some cheap one that jordan wiley lent me <laughs> yeah is he palming you off of his second hand gear is he <laughs> well he says i've got this and i'm like hey, roger mate uh, I've, I've i've never no, not experienced in it i've not swam swim you know i was, I was breaststroking across the belly solent um, okay so I, the reason i'm asking these questions down and a big part of the reason i wanted you on the podcast is um i'm really impressed with the fact that you just get into freezing cold water and you stay there for silly amounts of time yeah, I mean that that that's that's coming up definitely more this year, which we can touch on in a minute if you like. Yeah. Um, I, it, yeah. I bought um so quick story. I did a triathlon, right? An Olympic triathlon two summers ago or last summer. It was just before I was 50. And I came last, right? <laughs> yeah. I was third out the swim, and by the time I finished yapping to my family, everyone had got on their bikes yeah, yeah. so, I, so yeah. I was actually last 
the cycle was so much more difficult than I ever thought. Mind you, I, I have got a proper bike now, so it's a completely diff it's a massive game changer. Yeah. But um coming last, and they even tried to stop me finishing because I took so long, right? Yeah. So I, so I went from coming last in my first ever triathlon to doing a quadruple Ironman eight weeks later. Yeah. Good. <laughs> a quadruple Ironman distance triathlon, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And I bought this really Gucci wetsuit. It's one of the most expensive you can get. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but um, it's the one. It's got orange sleeves. It's got special pads here that yeah do that. that are supposed to add to your sensitivity in the is water. Zone three one is it, Benny Chance? Say again. Is it zone three? Yes, it is zone three. Of course, it is. And and aspire zone three one. Yeah, right. it's the it's the very it, it was the most newest one, right? Yeah, not the red one. They, they went they moved to graphite and orange sort of colors. Yeah. Anyway, when I did the triathlon in the summer, it was fine because it was in Torquay and and it was the water was as warm as swimming in, almost in the tropics. Really, it, yeah, it yeah, wasn't an issue. When I came to do the quadruple distance iron man um and i got in the water it was september the it would have been about september the 20th because it's my 50th birthday um or the next day was and within a mile mate i realized i was going down yeah yeah i was going down i was shivering un uncontrollably um which is why i always say to people have a have a plan B that doesn't screw up your plan A. So my plan B is I went to the indoor, to the indoor swimming pool. Yeah. And I swam 10, well, I think I had six miles left to swim. So I just swam six miles up and down. A, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was just luxury, to be honest. It wasn't even difficult. Yeah, and, and, and that's it. And is it, I, I suppose you, you've seen all my, my profile with the, the 10, 10 Ironman, um, which is sort of, so yeah, so I finished that level and and then the next one I thought I'll do um and this comes on to the ten Ironmen um of um I paddleboarded the Cal Caledonian Canal east the west coast of Scotland cycled eight hundred k seven hundred and ninety kilometers it was um and then ran a marathon down and finished at Tedworth House in Tidworth so I started in Inverness and finished at Tidworth uh over seven days I think it was. I've never paddleboarded. I didn't even own a bike. I borrowed one from Half Heroes, uh, a metal thing. It was in the middle of that storm, Ellen, and it was horrendous. And during the first, so three days paddleboarding, four days bike, one day running. During the paddleboarding phase, or sorry, the first day of the bike outside Glasgow, I fell off and broke my rib. Um, and I just carried on. I got to Stafford, and that's where I went to the hospital to NA. I said, like, something's going on here. And they said, yeah, cracked a rib. Um, so I just, but I just carried on, I suppose. And then eight weeks after that, so 17th of October was the start date. I was having a conversation with myself just prior to it. I was like, oh, what's next? And Because everyone tells me, do something that's relatable to what people know. And I thought, okay, could I do an Ironman? Yeah, yeah, I'd probably do one. Not going to be a good time, but yeah, I could do it. Not a strong swimmer. Can't really swim front crawl because of my shoulders, a bit dodgy. Um, and uh, could I do 10? Oh, that's a challenge. Let's do it. So I publicized I'll do is 10, 10 Ironmen across. So I've got, got some good kit on board. I've got a sponsor of Ribble Bike, um, sponsored from um, uh, Zone 3, that's why I know the wetsuit, um, and Salomon. So I've got three big brands for each one of them on board and also Resilient Nutrition to fuel me during it. Um, and that's rolled into. I thought, God, I can't swim. I know I need to get out of this water. I didn't realize it was going to be that cold, as you said. I've never done a triathlon in my life, not even a sprint. And I just went straight into attempting 10. And um, and that was over ten days, Daz. Is that right? Ten consecutive days. Yeah. So there's not because they do a decker man normally like in the same place. So I, I wanted to do it a bit more meaningful to me. So we did uh, meaningful military establishments for the first five days. Then I did the next five days. I did in in Icon, so on top of the shard in the London Eye. Finished on you know around Richmond Park and stuff and around war. So the one of the runs was around iconic war symbols around London. You know, and. Um, is there, a, is there a swimming pool on the shard? Is that what we're saying? Uh, no, so the, the, the five London ones, I swam in the Serpentine. 
okay uh lake and um yeah so day four hypothermia is smashed to me real and truly having to almost get dragged out of the water and um yeah just my body wasn't able to create heat generate heat i wasn't burning enough calories burning nine to ten thousand calories a day and only intaking about three to four because i just could not get any more food in my body and um yeah and i, I just couldn't really do anything and i just then grizzed it every day and, and i i didn't manage to do 10 um um I, something happened every day and it was the middle of a pandemic so i did 1545 kilometers which was the equivalent of 6.8 ironman distance over the 10 days which you know what it, i'm a bit disappointed i didn't do it but you know it was middle of pandemic things were ever forever changing um and uh you know my, my task was to raise five thousand pounds i raised 16 um, and and i got out i got the mess out there so it was it a success yes it was uh in my eyes um and then that the documentary was out on sunday actually um so talk about zone three there, there there's a big giveaway prize on that as well with a, a bite the zone three wetsuit that we talked about and, and a month's supply of nutrition so it's out on sunday so I'll, sh I'll share the link um when it comes out um starting to advertise it tonight so quite quite interesting that and then um and then just finishing off on that four weeks later i just didn't do any training i grizzed uh, the world's highest duathlon so i did a 10k run 150k bike 30k run so treadmill turbo treadmill in the altitude center in london and um there at 12,000 feet and that was horrendous that just took my the oxygen away it was was brutal which has basically then led into to this year and what's up and coming next and the Arctic is is back on track, uh, not for the Yukon Arctic Ultra, but for the world's most northern triathlon, and um, it'll be taking place in in April. So, yeah. What's the name of that triathlon? It's my own. It's they don't. No one does it. So okay. it's um. You, you uh, put this uh, together. Yeah, going to South Bar, um, and uh, someone's done one in in South Bar, but I'm going more northern. So. Uh, wow. Yeah. So. Uh, Talking about where so it's zone three or, or manufacturing me one, uh, Ribble's making me a fat bike, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna aim to set three records up there. So yeah. And and just to clarify, that's going to be the world's most northern triathlon, yeah. So there's a bit of a uh, there's a bit of a a bit of a thing with it. So it's going to be yeah the world's most northern triathlon, which is going to be a half Ironman distance, and then I'm gonna if see how that goes. I'm gonna attempt the full Ironman distance um yeah you want to get them to make you a really warm wetsuit because absolutely the all you've got to be able to do to swim a, for anyone listening to swim triathlon and people are going to probably hate me for saying this but you've just got to be able to move your arms you I'm haven't even got to be able to swim yeah. because the wetsuit keeps you so buoyant yeah you can you could do it without kicking your legs you could you know, I'm not. I'm not suggesting people do, and I'm not trying to diminish the one. Well, some people swims. don't kick the legs, don't they? Some some people use that as a tactic and save the legs for the bike and run. Mm. Um, so again, it's going to be I think minus sixteen to twenty. Then we've got to have a guide with us because the polar bears are all year round, orcas, etc. So um, see what happens, I suppose, and hopefully in April we we come back and make that happen. Yeah, because the wetsuit thing does is. It's all well and good having it thin under here so you can move your arms. But of course, uh, what I found is the wetsuit's only as good as the thinnest part. Uh, absolutely. And um, the, the problem I had on the on the 10 days is I lost six kilograms. So the wetsuit I started with became ineffective as I went along. As soon as I got in the water, it was a rush of freezing cold water that went down, down my back. And uh, How yeah, about? so... How, how did you deal with well i'm interested in how did you overcome that because i literally was going down i i, I was my teeth were shaking so much yeah i mean i, I was i did go down i uh, went down with hypothermia stage two in day four um so then i just so what what say the things to change and i realized i wasn't able to do the full distance every day so i basically went until cold every day um, which was getting about 2k in. So I ended up doing a lot of halves in there. Um, and then because my Achilles went, I ran till I could, couldn't run anymore. I cycled till I couldn't cycle anymore. And, and that's where it tied up the difference of 6.8. So, which I mean, is still from doing 
you know, nothing, never done a triathlon to 1500 kilometers in, in 10 days. It's not a bad effort, I think, and, and raising 16K. So I was chuffed at the end of it in a way. Yeah, well, it's that thing, isn't it? If you don't crack on and have a go at these things, you, you're you never going to surprise yourself. And Exactly. And and the, the documentary is called Perseverance. So it's about high. So we do a lot of talk on mindset um, on, on it and, and how I manage to, to do it every day, get up and do what I didn't want to do every day. Yeah, my mm. gosh. So what do you think of um, Pritchard then? Because... So funny, I was chatting to him before I asked him to come and join me on one of them. Um, but he was busy, tied up with all his stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty, pretty cool what he does. I mean, this year I am going to go and do 10 Ironmen in 10 days. Um, the, an unorganized deck a day in the summer <laughs> and, and in the same location. I think, I don't want to use the word easy because it won't be easy, but it will be so much more putting two hours of travel from A to B, taking that out of consideration, you know, and, and only setting yourself that 12 to 14 hours a day, you know, is, is so much more doable. Knowing all your admin sets up, I, I think it'll be a bit of a breeze. <laughs> so, um, oh. yeah, I mean, going back to Pritch, hmm. you know, I've taken a lot of inspiration from that guy. Yeah. You know, we, I think we come from, uh, let's just say our paths have probably crossed in the, you know, been on the same path in the past due to our, our partying habits. Yeah. Um, but both have become quite sort of spiritual and, and health, health conscious, mind conscious um, in our older years. Yeah. So for people watching who wonder who we're talking about, we're talking about Matthew Pritchard, who was one of the stars of the Dirty Stan Sanchez, Sanchez yeah. mm -hmm. Extreme Bodily Fluid Stunt Shows. <laughs> <laughs> That's a team way of putting it as well. Yeah, and it, yeah, I, I had massive respect them for doing that as well. It was, some of the stuff they did was so brave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brave bordering on just insanity. <laughs> um, but when I heard that he'd suddenly start to do these just extreme events, cycling, swimming, yeah, you know, he once went to the swimming pool and so, so swam something utterly ridiculous every day for a month, and and then I heard that he's doing this, um, or I think it was on London Real. I saw him talking about doing the Deca, the the Ironman a day for ten days That's with brutal events with Claire, who Claire owns that, and they they yeah yeah, and it's yeah it's. It's a thing. It, it, yeah. I, ugh, I'm struggling to. I mean, I don't want to say it's a breeze, and it's a breeze that'll be easy to do. I, the way I'm sort of the the breeze piece of it is, everything set up admin wise. All I have to do is worry about swim, bike, run. Whereas in that last one, I had to worry about. Oh no, one of the lakes a body was pulled from us. So we had to do one in a swimming pool, you know, um, because the lake was shut, and then. Because of COVID, I was only allowed 45 minutes in the swimming pool. So I had to swim as far as I could in that 45 minutes. So um, I had to, uh, two days before getting the London Eye, I had to get a public liability insurance, which they just sprung in the last minute. The treadmill people cancelled to start with, and I had to get in. Uh, no, so I, I was organising and worrying about all that and getting from A to B and where we were staying, et cetera, rather than worrying about swim, bike, run. So I, and, and there's two ways of doing a DECA as well. You can do a DECA, which is you do all the swimming, all the bike and all the running. Um, and you've got 14.6 days to do that. Or you can do a DECA day, which is a DECA on Ironman every day for 10 days. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to write, I, I completely get what you mean. In some respects, it's going to be, a, it will be a luxury for you. Yeah. Um, You'll have to come along and uh, maybe we'll do it together. Yeah, well, I'll certainly consider it. The, the thing is with me, Daz, is I'm not like a fitness guy. I, I just me either. I'm, I'm injured and falling to pieces. <laughs> yeah, I just rock up and do it and raise a bit of money for charity. And I, yeah. I generally, I put myself through so much pain in the process that I don't actually know if it's worth it, to be honest. Because Yeah, then that's the thing. And I'm exactly the same, you know, from not being able to even swim to, and, and it, I, I think the way I realized I started need to maybe train, especially for this Arctic one. 
yeah. <laughs> to um, give you an idea, and for people listening, watching, I, I get way more satisfaction from completing a half marathon than I did from running a length of the country, doing four, uh, four Ironman, quadruple Ironman distance triathlon. Um, and running 200 miles, those events, I end up quite depressed at the end of them because there's almost, there's always so much that's gone wrong, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean on that. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. On the on the Ironman one, the 10-10-10, the um, I got quite depressed even during as well because I set out a task of 10 Ironmen and you get the old keyboard warriors that sit and comment on everything that you do, but you know from the comfort of their own own home. You know, it's the whole um, you know, Roosevelt. This it's not this the critic that pants. You know, is, who's in the ring in the arena doing it with you? When then you can comment. You know, um, mm. and uh, social media actually. So I tried to talk about it a bit in the documentary of um, I'm quite toxic. You know, you know you, the, the area of oh, what what does this person that's never met me before know think about me? I'm worrying about that um to, to what my what my best friend thinks of me i'm comparing them on the exact same level uh, um you know so it's a bit weird that one but i, I think I've, I've, I've managed to get over that but then there's a bit of a come down you know you do all this fizz and your body releases all these good endur and endorphins etc and and then as um as i said I've, I've never 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 touched the drug really to be honest i I'd say really never so i but what i hear of people talking from a night out these recreational people that do it you know where there's a come down and I always get that after an event, um, but only after the world's highest duathlon, I've sort of managed to overcome that and, and work out, feel it coming on and, and really. So this year has been a very good learning, learning tool for me and, and, and defining what success is, you know, for, my, for myself um, versus, versus failure. And is failure actually a thing or is it now just a step that's done to success? Um, so, yeah, but I, I do get what you're saying with the come downy piece. <laughs> It's silly things, and again, to give people an idea of what the things I mean is, you know, it's no good coming up to me and going, oh, because you, you give it your best ever work. That, that means nothing to me. What means to me, did I fucking do it? it? You know, did I finish what I set out to do? Which yeah. is why I put myself through so much, you know, is yeah. like I I don't want to live as a failure. It, I, I'm not saying failure isn't good. I've done I've done it my whole life, right? But yeah. I've now got to the point where I only try and do things I'm going to succeed at, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and <sighs> lots of things like when I ran the length of the country on the last day, everyone was trying to take my backpack, and I'm like, I've carried it for thirty seven. <laughs> For, I actually carried it 35, uh, 34 days because two very good Marine friends of mine, Steve and Buster, hello guys, both got their own chapter in my uh, in my state of mind book. There we are. There's a plug if ever there was one. <laughs> It'll actually be up there in the podcast, but one of those books there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but they very kindly, they're, they're bootnecks, so they had to take my Bergen for me. That was just, I, I couldn't tell them that they couldn't do that. But it, it was just little things like that, that you just feel like saying, fuck off. And, um, oh, yeah. <sighs> yes, it, it's the, the bigger, the bigger the event, the more scope there is for something that's really going to like do your head in. Absolutely, and and it goes back to that silly but but real saying: no plan survives contact, doesn't it? Yeah, that's and that's why I say to people, um, have a plan B that doesn't screw up your plan A. You know? Yeah, yeah. You, you mm -hmm. don't have to finish your thing. Like I could have given up that quadruple distance Ironman mm -hmm. after after getting hypothermia, right? But I'm like, no, I'll just swap to the indoor swimming pool. Okay, it's maybe not so heroic. Um, well, that's it, and 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 likewise, you know, we we adapted some of the the cycling because it was deemed unsafe for me almost to go on the road from the hypothermia in the in the lake in the morning to on a turbo, which I would argue is probably harder <laughs> on a turbo trainer, um, because you just can't you don't have the downhill you you can't stop pedaling, you know, and it's just oh it's brutal. 
I hate <laughs> anything in the gym. Like when, when people go to a gym to run on a machine, it's, mm. I can't think of anything more boring. I mean, I've, I've done it myself, but that's, it's really laziness that if I want to get a quick mile in just to top up my workout, just hop on the machine and do that quick mile, listen, yeah. listen to a podcast, get in the car and go home. But I'd never go to the gym to run. No, <laughs> think- no, it's exactly the same. And, and, and going to the gym, you lift or you train whatever sort of strength condition session you do. And then you and then you send us a quick top up at the end of, of anything. It's like going to a restaurant and eating outside. Yeah, which is the new world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well, Daz, I tell you what, you're an absolute inspiration. It's, it's, I, it's great that I can chat to people like you because I don't get anyone to talk to this stuff. I don't. I'm going to be honest. I know there are podcasts for endurance athletes out there, and I've listened to a few, and they're great. You get some like Sean Conway on, and. Mm. Matthew Pritchard and it's for me I'm, I'm in my element yeah I don't think though that people appreciate this sort of thing as much as for, for the value that they should do mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know no, you're right yeah mm-hmm. you know I'll get some SAS guy on everyone goes crazy it's like yeah but you've heard their story a million times before they just join the army that's it, it, it this guy's to 10 10 i you know well attempt <laughs> yeah well you, even better you know and, and and next year you or this year you're gonna go you're gonna go and smash it again yeah um, yeah there's so much to learn from this mindset yeah i, I absolutely you, you're absolutely right mate and and in in my book coming out you know it's more of a biography but at the end of it it's a more of the lessons learned yeah you know, mindset and it's you know, without wishing to sound like I'm pushing the point for our for our younger friends watching, you know, this is the stuff that you, you know, you do this stuff, you think like this, then it won't be long in your life before you can kick back and rats and go, do you know what? I've actually achieved quite some shit. You know, mm-hmm. I've run a marathon. I've thrown myself out of a plane. I've done, and I'm cool. You know, I've done something with my life, right? And, and I think the great danger is, is getting to the end of your life and going, well, I watched 36 podcasts about the SBS, <laughs> play Call of Duty 967,000 times, yeah. um, slagged off everyone on my keyboard who I didn't even know and they didn't even yeah. know me. Yeah, I, I'm being a bit facetious, friends, but you get my point. But learn Daz's mindset this right i've never done it before but let's let's get stuck in let's give it my best if it doesn't go the way who cares i've still achieved way more than a i expected to or Mm -hmm. you know would have done if i had not done it and b more than more than most other people yeah Um, it's a wonderful thing i see um i was i I had a couple of texts the other day with the iron cowboy you know the guy did 50 iron men 50 days 50 states yeah at least have you I haven't spoken to him. Can you put us in touch? Do you know him? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, um, I'll drop my message, mate. Yeah. Yeah, please um, do. Because uh, his new challenge in 54 days' time, he's doing 100 Ironmen in 100 days. Gosh, and where's he doing them? And, Over and, in the States, yeah. yeah. Any, any particular locations? or? Well, the, his 50 Ironmen 50 days was in, in 50 states, so brutal. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll yeah I'll message him on um on Instagram where where I sent him my um release to the documentary of the ten ten ten. So um yeah, and we'll uh, just tell him I will get him through this. I've got a few tips for him. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yes, it's the rum. Tell him to buy a big bottle of rum. Yeah, hundred percent. Mine's Guinness. You see, at the end of my events, have a Guinness. Yes. Oh wow. Well, well does listen. It's been absolutely wonderful. I'll be honest, mate. I I'd love to chat to you for another five hours now. But... Yeah, mate. Well, we'll stay stay in touch, um, and um, I'll, I'll share the links of the documentary and stuff. And um, I'll drop you a trailer now in a minute. I'll um, I'll, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll message you and I'll WhatsApp it over to you. Get... If there's anything that we can use in the podcast that's not copyright, because anything copyright just gets flagged on YouTube by YouTube software. It's all like registered at some office, you know. Um, 
but anything you can um, give us for the to make a little montage about what you've done, or even if it's just some photos you can give us. My my producer Ben's an absolute wizard with all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah, um, I'll get so, them over, mate. Yeah, not a problem. I said I've got them all, and um, um, we'll put all your links below the video. Is there anything just off the bat? You know, where where do, are you an Instagram person? Yeah, Instagram. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send you my my handles. Yeah, um, you could do I'll, that. We'll yeah. put them all below the video. Save going through them all. All now. We must say another massive thank you to Claire Vosper for putting us in touch. Thanks, Claire. Indeed. Um, I certainly will think about the Decathlon, <laughs> if that's yes. its name. Yeah. Um, like I said, mate, I'm not really like a fitness guy. I, I run for mental health dance, you know. Yeah, and that's and that's why I sort of started it, you know. And it's yeah. I, I a mile round the block in the morning. I don't even run a mile. It's not point nine of a mile is my morning run. Yeah. And I do it because it makes me feel bloody wonderful about myself and life. And this is why I tell everyone, get up at half four, go out for a run, dead silent. It's just you this morning, you know, minus two, crystal clear. You see the crystals in the air. That's amazing. Love it. Especially, I mean, I'm, I'm living in the city at the moment. So to be honest, it's not. It's the changing of the seasons makes makes the run. You know, it's yep. that going out. There's a beautiful sky or there's a bit of snow on the ground that makes the run. But if you live in a countryside, you you really need to get on it. You know, get oh, yeah. on the trails, run through the woods. Yeah, hundred percent. Reservoirs. It's just incredible. That's it. Or walk. You know, run, walk. Ultra that's running is all about walking, running anyway, isn't it? So a hundred percent and that's it you know now and trying to break your day up and get now i'm going for a walk because i've got a work call coming up and i'm just going to go out and walk whilst on it that's a great i'd never even thought about that <laughs> people laugh at me i walk around with a notebook and one hand the pen another of my things in and do do a complete work call well if i stick this map on my shoulders somehow like yeah, mate, on, yeah. on a bergen or something you're right you go around i can do my podcasts yeah <laughs> out in the nature <laughs> yeah Daz I wish you all the best of luck I can't wait to chat again keep in touch massive um respect to you for getting on top of the mental health and putting this wonderful message out and making the money for charity and uh yeah just doing what what doing what you do and um amazing thanks for having me on buddy yeah really good to meet you no worries just just stay on the line mate while I say goodbye to everyone at home everybody at home massive thank you as always for tuning in i really hope you 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 got something from this chat because if i did and i'm 51 now <laughs> i didn't think i got room to get more from chats but i i do every time i speak to someone like Daz, um people like this make my life brilliant if 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 you can make sense of that you'll 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 know why why i get so much out of this much love to you all. Please like and subscribe. Ciao.